You live in West Egg, she remarked contemptuously. I know somebody there. I don't know a single. You must know Gatsby. Gatsby, demanded Daisy. What Gatsby? Before I could reply that he was my neighbor, dinner was announced. Wedging his tense arm imperatively under mine, Tom Buchanan compelled me from the room as though he were moving a checker to another square. Slenderly, languidly, their hands set lightly on their hips, the two young women preceded us out into the rosy-colored porch, open toward the sunset where four candles flickered on the table in the diminished wind. Why candles? objected Daisy, frowning. She snapped them out with her fingers. In two weeks, it'll be the longest day in a year, she looked at us radiantly. Do you always watch for the longest day of the year and then miss it? I always watch for the longest day in the year and then miss it. We ought to plan something, yawned Miss Baker, sitting down at the table as if she were getting into bed. All right, said Daisy. What'll we plan? She turned to me helplessly. What do people plan? Before I could answer, her eyes fastened with an awed expression on her little finger. Look, she complained. I heard it. We all looked. The knuckle was black and blue. You did it, Tom, she said accusingly. I know you didn't mean to, but you did do it. That's what I get from marrying a brute of a man, a great big hulking physical specimen of a... I hate that hul word, hulking, objected Tom crossly, even in kidding. Hulking, insisted Daisy. Sometimes she and Miss Baker talked at once, unobtrusively, and with a bantering inconsequence that it was never quite chatter. That was as cool as their white dresses and their impersonable eyes in the absence of all desire. They were here, and they accepted Tom and me, making only a polite, pleasant effort to entertain or to be entertained. They knew that presently dinner would be over, and a little later the evening, too, would be over and casually put away. It was sharply different from the West, where an evening was hurried from phase to phase towards its close in a continually disappointed anticipation, or else in sheer nervous dread of the moment itself. You make me feel uncivilized, Daisy, I confessed on my second glass of quirky, but rather impressive claret. Can't you talk about crops or something? I meant nothing in particular by this remark, but it was taken up in an unexpected way. Civilization's going to pieces, broke out Tom violently. You've got to be a terrible pessimist about things. Have you read The Rise of the Colored Empires by this man Goddard? Why, no, I answered, rather surprised by his tone. Well, it's a fine book, and everybody ought to read it. The idea is, if we don't look out, the race, the white race, will be, will be utterly submerged. It's all scientific stuff. It's been proved. Tom's getting very profound, said Daisy with an expression of unthoughtful sadness. He reads deep books with long words in them. What was the word we... Well, these books are all scientific, insisted Tom, glancing at her impatiently. This fellow has worked out the whole thing. It's up to us, who are the dominant race, to watch out or these other races will have control of things. We've got to beat them down, whispered Daisy, winking ferociously towards the fervent sun. You ought to live in California, began Miss Baker, but Tom interrupted her by shifting heavily in his chair. The idea is that we're Nordics. I am, and you are, and you are, and after an infinitesimal hesitation, he included Daisy with a slight nod, and she winked at me again. And we've produced all the things that go to make civilization. Oh, science and art and all that. Do you see? There was something pathetic in his concentration, as if his complacency more acute than of old, was not enough to him anymore. When almost immediately the telephone rang inside and the butler left the porch, Daisy seized upon the momentary interruption and leaned forward toward me. I'll tell you a family secret, she whispered enthusiastically. It's about the butler's nose. Do you want to hear about the butler's nose? Well, that's why I came over tonight. Well, he wasn't always a butler. He used to be uh, the silver polisher for some people in New York that had a silver service for 200 people. He had to polish it from morning till night until finally it began to affect his nose. Things went from bad to worse, suggested Miss Baker. Yes, things went from bad to worse until finally he had to give up his position. For a moment, the last sunshine fell with romantic affection upon her glowing face. Her voice compelled me forward breathlessly as I listened, then glow faded, each light deserting her with lingering regret, like children leaving a pleasant street at dusk. 
The butler came back and murmured something close to Tom's ear, whereupon Tom frowned, pushed back his chair, and without a word went inside. As if his absence quickened something within her, Daisy leaned forward again, her voice glowing and singing. I love to see you at my table, Nick. You remind me of a, of a rose, an absolute rose, doesn't he? She turned to Miss Baker for confirmation. An absolute rose? This was untrue. I'm not even faintly like a rose. She was extemporizing, but a stirring warmth flowed from her as if her heart was trying to come out to you, concealed in one of those breathless, thrilled words. Then suddenly she threw her napkin on the table and excused herself and went into the house. Miss Baker and I exchanged a short glance, consciously devoid of meaning. I was about to speak when she sat up alertly and said, shh, in a warning voice. A subdued and passionate murmur was audible from the room beyond, and Miss Baker leaned forward unashamed, trying to hear. The murmur trembled on the verge of coherence, sank down, mounted excitedly, and then ceased altogether. This Mr. Gatsby that you spoke of is my neighbor, I said. Don't talk. I want to hear what happens. Is something happening? I inquired innocently. You mean to say you don't know, said Miss Baker, honestly surprised. I thought everybody knew. I don't. Why, she said hesitantly, Tom's got some woman in New York. Got some woman, I repeated blankly. Miss Baker nodded. She might have had the decency not to telephone him at dinner, don't you think? Almost before I had grasped her meaning, there was a flutter of a dress and the crunch of leather boots, and Tom and Daisy were back at the table. It couldn't be helped, cried Daisy with tense gaiety. She sat down, glanced searchingly at Miss Baker and then at me, and continued, I looked outdoors for a minute, and it's very romantic outdoors. There's a bird on the lawn that I think might be a nightingale come over on the cunner to the white star line. He's singing away, her voice sang. It's romantic, isn't it, Tom? Very romantic, he said, and then miserable to me. If it's light enough after dinner, I want to take you down to the stables. The telephone rang inside, starting, and as Daisy shook her head decisively at Tom, the subject of the stables, in fact, all subjects, vanished into air. Among the broken fragments of the last five minutes at table, I remember the candles being lit again, pointlessly, and I was conscious of wanting to look squarely at every one, and yet to avoid all eyes. I couldn't guess what Daisy and Tom were thinking, but I doubt if even Miss Baker, who seemed to have mastered a certain hearty skepticism, was able to utterly put this fifth guess shrill metallic urgency out of mind. To a certain temperament, the situation might have seemed intriguing. My own instinct was to telephone immediately for the police. The horses, needless to say, were not mentioned again. Tom and Miss Baker, with several feet of twilight between them, strolled back into the library as if to a vigil beside a perfectly tangible body. While trying to look pleasantly interested and a little deaf, I followed Daisy around a chain of connecting verandas to the porch in front. In its deep gloom, we sat down side by side on a wicker settee. Daisy took her face in her hands as if feeling its lovely shape, and her eyes moved gradually out into the velvet dusk. I saw the turbulent emotions possessed her, so I asked what I thought would be some sedative questions about her little girl. We don't know each other very well, Nick, she said suddenly. Even if we are cousins, you didn't come to my wedding. I wasn't back from the war. That's true, she hesitated. Well, I've had a very bad time, Nick, and I am pretty cynical about everything. Evidently, she had reason to be. I waited, but she didn't say any more. And after a moment, I returned rather feebly to the subject of her daughter. I suppose she talks, and eats, and everything? Oh yes, she looked at me absently. Listen, Nick, let me tell you what I said when she was born. Would you like to hear? Very much. I'll show you how I've gotten to feel about things. Well, she was less than an hour old, and Tom was God knows where. I woke up out of the ether with an utterly abandoned feeling, and asked the nurse right away if it was a boy or girl. She told me it was a girl, and so I turned my head away and wept. All right, I said. I'm glad it's a girl, and I hope she'll be a fool. That's the best thing a girl can be in this world, a beautiful little fool. You see, I think everything's terrible anyhow, she went on in a convinced way. 
Everybody thinks so. The most advanced people, and I know, I've been everywhere and seen everything and done everything. Her eyes flashed around her in a defiant way, rather like Tom's, and she laughed with a thrilling scorn. Sophisticated. God, I'm sophisticated! The instant her voice broke off, ceasing to compel my attention, my belief, I felt the basic insincerity of what she had said. It made me uneasy, as though the whole evening had been a trick of some sort to exact a contributory emotion from me. I waited, and sure enough, in a moment, she looked at me with an absolute smirk on her lovely face, as if she asserted her membership in a rather distinguished secret society to which she and Tom belonged. Inside, the crimson room bloomed with light. Tom and Miss Baker sat at either end of the long couch, and she read aloud to him from the Saturday Evening Post. The words, murmurous and uninflicted, running together in a soothing tone. The lamplight, bright on his boots and dull on the autumn leaf yellow of her hair, glinted along the paper as she turned a page with a flutter of slender muscles in her arms. When we came in, she held us silent for a moment with a lifted hand. To be continued, she said, tossing the magazine on the table, in our very next issue. Her body asserted itself with a restlessness movement of her knee, and she stood up. Ten o'clock, she remarked, apparently finding the time on the ceiling. Time for this good girl to go to bed. Jordan's going to play in the tournament tomorrow, explained Daisy, over at Westchester. Oh, you're Jordan Baker! I knew why her face was familiar. Its pleasing, contemptuous expression had looked out at me from many rotogravure pictures of the sporting life at Asheville and Hot Springs and Palm Beach. I had heard some story of her, too. Critical, unpleasant story, but what it was I had forgotten long ago. Good night, she said softly. Wake me at eight, won't you? If you'll get up. I will. Good night, Mr. Carraway. See you anon. Of course you will, confirmed Daisy. In fact, I think I'll arrange a marriage. Come on. Come over often, Nick, and I'll sort of, oh, fling you together. You know, lock you up accidentally in linen closets and push you out to sea in a boat and all that sort of thing. Good night, called Miss Baker from the stairs. I haven't heard a word. She's a nice girl, said Tom in a moment. They oughtn't to let her run around the country this way. Who oughtn't to, inquired Daisy coldly. Her family. Her family is one aunt about a thousand years old. Besides, Nick's going to look after her, aren't you, Nick? She's going to spend lots of weekends out here this summer. I think the home influence will be very good for her. Daisy and Tom looked at each other for a moment in silence. Is she from New York, I asked quickly? From Louisville. Our white girlhood was passed together there. Our beautiful white... Did you give Nick a little heart-to-heart -heart on the talk on the veranda, demanded Tom suddenly. Did I? She looked at me. I can't seem to remember, but I think we talked about the Nordic race. Yes, I'm sure we did. It sort of crept up on us, and first thing you know, I don't believe, don't believe everything you hear, Nick, he advised me. I said lightly that I had heard nothing at all, and a few minutes later, I got up to go home. They came to the door with me and stood side by side in a cheerful square of light. As I started my motor, Daisy preemptorily called, Wait! I forgot to ask you something, and it's important. We heard you were engaged to a girl out west. That's right, corroborated Tom kindly. We heard you were engaged. It's libel. I'm too poor. But we heard it, insisted Daisy, surprising me by opening up in a flower-like way. We heard it from three people, so it must be true. Of course I knew what they were referring to, but I wasn't even vaguely engaged. The fact that Gossip had published the bands was one of the reasons I had to come east. You couldn't, you can't stop going with an old friend on account of rumors. And on the other hand, I had no intention of being rumored into marriage. Their interest to get rather touched me and made them less remotely rich. Nevertheless, I was confused and a little disgusted as I drove away. It seemed to me that the thing for Daisy to do was to rush out of the house, child in arms, but apparently there was no such intentions in her head. As for Tom, the fact that he had some woman in New York was really less surprising than that he had been depressed by a book. Something was making him nibble at the edge of the stale ideas as if his sturdy physical egotism no longer nourished his peremptory heart. Already it was deep summer on roadhouse roofs and in front of wayside garages where new 
Red gas pumps sat out in pools of light, and when I reached my estate at West Egg, I ran the car under its shed and sat for a while on an abandoned grass roller in the yard. The wind had blown off, leaving a loud, bright night with wings beating in the trees and a persistent organ sound as the full bellows of the earth blew with the frogs full of life. The silhouette of a moving cat wavered across the moonlight, and turning my head to watch it, I saw that I was not alone. Fifty feet away, a figure had emerged from the shadow of my neighbor's mansion and was standing with his hands in pockets regarding the silver pepper of the stars. Something in his leisurely movements and the secure position of his feet upon the lawn suggested that it was Mr. Gatsby himself come out to determine what share was his of our local heavens. I decided to call him. Miss Baker had mentioned him at dinner and that would do for an introduction. But I didn't call to him before he gave a sudden in intimation that he was content to be alone. He stretched out his arms toward the dark water in a curious way and far as I was from him, I could have sworn he was trembling. Involuntarily, I glanced seaward and distinguished nothing except a single green light, minute and far away. That might have been the end of a dock. When I looked once more for Gatsby, he had vanished, and I was alone again in the unquiet darkness.